All right, I think we're live. Cool, so great. It's uh, really great to see so many people out for the webinar. Uh, this is the webinar on introducing Thoughtly.py version three. So first I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so just a quick background on myself. Uh, my name is John Meese. I originally studied physics and math at Millersville University and then did my graduate work in computer science at Johns Hopkins University. I uh, now work as a data scientist and software developer at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And one of my current areas of interest there is, is working to apply what I see as some of the best of the Python open data science ecosystem to some of our, I think, challenging engineering and analysis problems. And in the process of learning Python and getting involved in the data science community, I've become a contributor to a few open source projects. Uh, first pandas and then Dask, and then now what we'll talk about today is my work on, on Plotly. So to understand uh, what's new in version three of the Plotly Python library, I want to give you a quick background of how this fits into the kind of larger Plotly ecosystem. So Plotly.js is the JavaScript data visualization library. Um, it's built on the web technologies D3 and WebGL. This visualization library from JavaScript, it supports a really wide range of, of trace types. Um, it's cover a lot of uh, visualization types across two-dimensional, three-dimensional, financial, geographic use cases. And uh, this is one of the reasons I initially got interested in working with Plotly. It was this uh, really wide range and very flexible uh, set of visualizations that you have to work with. And uh, Plotly.js, it was originally developed by the company uh, Plotly Technologies Incorporated. I think it was developed back in 2013, uh, but it was open sourced in 2015. Uh, it's open source under the MIT license, and it's been in active development on GitHub ever since. So just to be clear up front, all of the technology I'm going to show you today um, with the Python library, the JavaScript visualizations, this is all open source. It's all totally free. You can use it offline. It's self-contained. It doesn't require an account. Um, the integration that the Python library does have with the plot. Uh, LY cloud services uh, is, is optional. And that's not what I'm going to talk about today. All right. So Poly.js is a declarative library. And so what that means is that every visualization, uh, you, can, you can be fully specified by a JSON data structure. And in addition, the JavaScript library provides a lot of uh, nice API features where you can update existing plots in place once you create them. And you can register events um, so when their user interacts with the plot, like they clicking or selecting points, you can register callbacks to be run on those interaction events. Um, but for the Python library, prior to version three, um, so version 2.7 was the, the most recent version before version three, um, the way it would work is that your Python library would build up this declarative structure, and you'd use um, Python classes in the graph objects hierarchy uh, to do that, and then you would pass this declarative structure to the JavaScript library. This would happen through the, um, the iplot or the plot methods. And then the JavaScript library would display the plot. So it was a one-way, one-time transfer of that information from the Python side to the JavaScript side. And there was no way to update a plot once it was already created. And there's also no way to get that callback information, the interaction events, back to the Python side. So that's where the IPy widgets frame. Uh, so this framework provides really powerful building blocks for supporting the two-way uh, communication between the back-end Python kernel and the front-end JavaScript uh, Jupyter Notebook environment. So what I did is I created a Python IPy widget for the Plotly.js library. And I actually did this uh, kind of on my own off to the side. And then after I kind of showed it to the Plotly team, they were excited about it. And then with a lot of their help, we've integrated that into Plotly.py for version 3. So from there, what I want to show you is a few uh, web resources. Um, so I'm going to jump through a bunch of links in the presentation today. The place to get them is I've pinned a bunch of these on my Twitter page. I'll just drop this link in the chat. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, links to some stuff I'm going to scan through here. So if you want to follow along, uh, feel free. The first one is this uh, announcement post. So this was a pretty detailed write-up we did um, for the initial release of Plotly.py 3.0 that has some 
just good general information about the whole feature set. Uh, talks about the basic widget support that I'll show you live live in a minute here. So if you haven't read through this yet, I give it a read. It gives you some good context. Uh, the next thing I want to point you to is the the Plotly.py GitHub repository. So this front page of the GitHub repository has uh, what are currently the best installation instructions for getting all the stuff working. So if you go down to the installation instructions for version three, um, there are a couple pieces that you need. So the most recent version we have right now is version 3.1.0. So you can install that. And then to use Plotly.py in the notebook that I'm going to show you, you also have to have the notebook and the IPy widgets library installed. Um, these are not required dependencies of Plotly.py. You can still use Plotly without the notebook environment. So they don't get installed automatically. So you have to run this extra step to install the notebook and install the widgets framework. Um, and in addition, if you want to do this in JupyterLab, I'm going to show you how this works in, in the JupyterLab environment. Um, there's another set of uh, installation steps you need to go through, and they're detailed here. Uh, just to uh, kind of get you off to a, to a good start, the, the version numbers here are very important. These versions have to all line up. So I have explicit version numbers in all these installation steps. So stick to those, and that combination works well together. Um, and I'll be keeping this uh, list of version numbers up to date as, as we release new versions. All right. Then finally, here's the repository of the notebooks that I want to show you some of these notebooks today. So this is the Plotly IPA Widgets uh, Notebooks repository. Um, this is not the main documentation page. This is the set of uh, notebooks that really, um, they're sort of in progress, and they, they demonstrate the live two-way interactions of, of the uh, new figure widget uh, framework. And this repository also has some instructions for um, cloning it and then creating an environment with the requirements in the repository. Or you can also run the notebook examples in this repository uh, in your browser without installing anything using this service called Binder. Um, so it takes a, a couple minutes to build, but with, with Binder, you, you click this button to launch it, um, and it'll spin up a, a Docker container for you and basically work through the process of installing the requirements inside a Docker container and present you with uh, a notebook in your browser that you can try things out in. It's really, really cool. So. If you're interested in that kind of thing, check out the Binder project. All right. Now, here I am in, uh, in JupyterLab. Um, so I'm going to start by opening up uh, this overview notebook. All right, great. And let me change this to presentation mode. And hopefully, that's a reasonable, reasonable size for people. Um, so this notebook goes through a uh, just a, a simple set of steps that I think walk, walk you through a lot of the interactive features that are new in version 3. Um, so I'm going to step through this and just talk through with you uh, what, what's not possible. So basic imports. So I'm going to load uh, the Iris data set. Um, this is a common data set you've probably seen before. Uh, it comes uh, with uh, scikit-learn. Um, so here I'm just using scikit-learn to load this data set into a pandas data frame. And in the end, I have these four features in a data frame. I think they're about, about 150 rows in this, in this data set. And then I'm going to show you this new class. So uh, prior versions of Plotly had this plotly.graph objects package. And underneath graph objects, you would uh, create, create a figure, um, figure class. Now there's a new class called figure widget that you can use. Uh, we create a figure widget class. You can create it without anything. Um, you can create it empty without necessarily having initialized with anything, and then display it. So when you display this figure object in the notebook, the representation of the object is the figure itself. So you, if you're familiar with past versions of Plotly.py, uh, you would use something like the iplot methods or the plot methods to display a figure. When you're using a figure widget, you don't have to use those. It'll display itself in the notebook. And then what's really uh, nice about it is, as you'll see, there's a, a live link between this figure one, this F1 variable, and the display of the plot. So if, before we get into that, I'll show you some other, some of the new um, features related to tab completion. But F1 is this figure object. Um, and now there are a new set of methods on the figure object that allow you to add traces to an existing figure. So if you type add underscore and trigger completion in the Jupyter notebook, 
you'll get this list of all of the trace types that PolySub works. There are over 30 of these now. Um, and then as you kind of select through them, I can uh, accept completion on scatter. I can use a uh, shift tab in the notebook to pull up a documentation uh, pop-up. And with that, I can look through and see the documentation for what a scatter trace is. And then even more importantly, the names and descriptions of all of the parameters that this trace accepts. Um, so one of my goals in doing this rework was to provide like the best, the best that I could to make the development experience in the notebook really uh, helpful, have the documentation close at hand all the time, and really reduce the need to switch back and forth between your notebook and some other external documentation source. So I put a lot of effort into making, putting the documentation everywhere that, it, that it, I think is going to be useful. So all this documentation about the traces is in this add scatter method, and it'll also show up other places that are, where it's possible to add, to add traces. All right, so that was just to show you the documentation. I'm actually going to use that method to add a new trace to the figure. So here I'm calling add scatter, passing in the x and y uh, values of the scatter plot to be the SQL length and width of this data set. I run that, and I'll scroll back up, and I can see right away I have a, a line plot populated on this on these axes. Uh, before I go any further, I'm going to create a new view for this figure by right-clicking on the output cell and selecting Create New View for Output. This is a really neat new feature of JupyterLab that, that works well with uh, IPy widget um, libraries. So now I have an independent view of this figure, and I can kind of dock it on the side here. Um, it's responsive. It'll resize with the other um, figure that kind of get, get things arranged the way I want. Uh, these views are actually synchronized. So if I zoom in on one, they'll both uh, re resync together. So these are actually uh, linked together and they'll link back to that same variable. So now I can kind of leave this view behind and just focus on my side panel view as I continue to make changes to the figure. All right. So this is not actually what I wanted. I don't want these lines. This is supposed to be a, a point plot I wanted to. Um, so in Poly, the scatter trace is used for both point plots and line plots. So here, the default was chosen to be uh, to show the lines. And I'd like to change it to show the markers instead. So this object that's returned by the add scatter method uh, is a um, object that has its own properties. So I can, again, trigger tag completion on this scatter object. And look and sort through those properties. I can see that here's a mode property in Scatter. If I uh, hit Enter to, to accept the completion, I can use Shift Tab to launch the documentation string for this single property. So here I see this is the property that determines the mode of the Scatter trace, and it can be set to a combination of text, lines, and markers. And then here are the details of exactly what types it accepts. So the default um, was markers, and I can see that by just running this expression and I'm sorry, the default was lines. Uh, so if I run the expression scatter.mode, it'll show me that the default that the front end chose was lines. And then I can uh, just set that to markers, and it'll change instantly. So the variables that I'm using in the notebook are, are automatically linked to what is happening in this output view. There's no need to manually push the changes to the notebook. Um, this synchronization happens, happens automatically. All right, so I ran that. Um, same thing out for the size. So I can dig into these nested properties. So marker was a compound property. So under scatter, I can get completion on marker. And under marker, there are different marker properties. So I can find completion now down to size, uh, request documentation on size. And then I see, OK, it, it has to be a number. And I even have information on the, the kind of number it is. It needs to be an, a number between 0 and infinity. It has to be a, a non-negative number. Um, Something else that might be interesting, if, I, if my goal is to make this, these points larger, um, it'd be nice to know what this current size is. Um, so in past versions of PolyEdipi, you couldn't really figure this out. You'd have to sort of guess different uh, point sizes um, and just sort of see what happens. But now that there's this two-way synchronization between the front end and the back end, I can just run this expression, marker.size, and it shows me the default value of size that the front end chose, that the PolyJS chose, is 6. So to make it larger now, I can make an informed adjustment to that and say, well, I want it to be 8. And the points get a little larger. Or make it a little clearer, I can make it 12 and make them even larger. So I can iteratively refine the properties of the plots as I'm doing my analysis to help me see the information, see the data better. I'm going to do a quick uh, just aside on validation here. So 
what if I hadn't read the documentation string? And I don't usually read them right away. I usually just try stuff. So if I had uh, accidentally set this marker size to negative one, um, I get a really nice error message. So the error message, there is now validation in the Python library for all these properties, both their types and their values. Um, so here the Python library is telling me that this uh, size of negative one, this is a bogus value, the size has to be a positive or non-negative number. So there's no guessing, there's no just sort of silent failure anymore. You get this clear error message right away telling you that you messed something up and giving you as clear as we can an explanation of what you should use instead. And then the same thing happens for the different types. So that was a, a number. Uh, here's what happens if you give it a bad color. So I had an extra E to, to green here. Um, Poly.py accepts a whole lot of different ways to specify colors. You can use hex strings, you can use RGB values, you can use all these named CSS colors. Um, but what I specified here wasn't any of them. So I realize now I had a typo in my color green, and I can run it again, and now the color updates automatically. All right, so the next thing I want to do is uh, start exploring this data a little more. So uh, if I look at that documentation tree for color one more time, and scroll down, I can see there's actually another option at the bottom here. I can set the color to either a single number or a list or an array of numbers. And numbers, it tells me, are interpreted as colors according to the marker's color scale property. So this iris class variable, um, this iris class variable is a NumPy array of the numbered classes in uh, this data set. And so if I use that to set the color, it'll automatically be interpreted as these numbers will be interpreted as a color and shown uh, as updates to the points color. Uh, I'm not going to go through these next steps in detail, but I can show you that as you, uh, as I'm just modifying these properties of the marker, I can specify the, a new color scale. So I can say I want these uh, numbers that correspond to red, green, and blue. Um, I can make adjustments to how the color bar looks. So here I'm going to name the color bar so that I see the different iris class names uh, in the color scale. I can do things like add a title to the color bar. Up here it shows up right away. And you can learn about the properties really uh, uh, much more easily now by just exploring the tab completion and seeing what options are available at all these different levels. OK, let me just jump down. I'll show you another feature quick. Uh, there's a new uh, way to specify animations from the Python library. This is uh, something we call a, a Animation Context Manager. So if I take my figure and use this Python Context Manager construct, um, I can say that everything inside this scope of the width uh, batch animate context manager, I want that to be animated, if, if possible. So here, the scatter trace does support animation. So if I run this expression uh, where I'm updating the size to a different value, and you watch carefully on the plot as I run this, I'll run it a few times back and forth, you can see that the points smoothly interpolate between the original size of eight and then this larger size that indicates the uh, petal length of property. So those are the animation context managers. And then for time, let me scan down here a little more. Now I'm just going to update the color scale and configure these uh, the scatter points for something called, called brushing. So the idea of a brushing is that you support, um, allow users to select points in a plot, and then based on that selection, you update colors in that plot plus potentially other plots as well. Um, so here, what I've done is I've just specified that I want the selected colors to be red, and the unselected points to stay this light gray color. So the way that I can uh, apply this sort of brushing uh, construct is I can use a, a callback function. So if you look down here on the scatter object, there's a new set of methods, I'll start with on, on underscore, that are the allow you to specify Python functions to be run when in response to user interaction events. So here I'm going to use the on selection uh, method. I pull documentation for that. This, is a, this will let me register a function to be run whenever uh, there's a data selection in the plot. And here's an example of how you create the function and register it. So this is the function I'm going to use. I need to brush. And what I'm doing is whenever uh, I have a selection, I'm going to grab the indices of the points that were selected. 
just turn this into a NumPy array, and then uh, update the color of the points based on that selection. So if I run this and run the on selection to register the callback, I can now switch to the box selection tool, select some points, release, and that releasing of the selection triggers the Python function to be run, which then updates the colors of the plot. Same thing works for the lasso selection. So what's really neat here is this is actually running Python code. Whenever I release and run the selection, I, I'm running a Python function. I can do whatever I want. I can update other plots as well. So that's what I'm going to show you quickly here, is if I do the same, same idea, I'm going to quickly create a second plot with, some, with a different pair of features from that original data frame. And then bottom here, I have two plots now. And I've joined them together with a, with a um, single callback function. So this is a new brush function that's going to get run when either of the points have a selection. And it'll basically do the same logic of finding the indices of the selected points and then update the colors of both plots based on those indices. And then I also use an IPy widgets button to, um, to basically let me clear the colors and reset the colors. So uh, this reset brush function will get run whenever I click this button. And the reset brush function just zeroes out the colors, sets them all to zero, so they'll go back to gray. And then I wired up a, a little dashboard here in the notebook. I've basically used some layout functions, layout ob classes from the IPy widgets framework to um, arrange the two plots and the button into a layout. And now I can select in this plot, my colors update in both together. So I can see the linked correlation between these four dimensions um, interactively as I'm exploring this data in my notebook. Um, I can use the clear button to reset the colors again and move on with my exploration. Uh, so I hope you get, get an idea of uh, what, what kind of level of coding it takes to make these. You, you learn a little bit about the callback functions. You learn a little bit about how IPy widgets work. And you can wire up these custom dashboards in the notebook kind of as, as you're going as part of your analysis process. It doesn't need to be a one-size-fits-all sort of software development effort. You can just make them, make them as you go. Um, and I want to leave some time for questions. So I think I'm going to just point you to the other notebooks that I have here, um, tell you a couple things about them. Uh, if you watch the talk that I gave at SciPy a couple weeks ago, I go through an example of this um, cars exploration notebook. So this is a, a similar idea. I build up a, a little dashboard that um, updates an image and a table based on the hover interactions. So this is using a hover callback function. So if you watch the SciPy video, you can get a good overview of, of this notebook. Um, the New York City taxi selection data set, this one is, is a, a similar idea where I'm setting up a brushing scenario. But I'm basically demonstrating here that this uh, approach scales to large data sets. I, I can do, you can do this on uh, data sets with over a million points if you're using the WebGL accelerated scatter trace. So again, I go through this one in, in the sci-fi video. So that, that's on YouTube, and there's a link to it in that uh, list of Oh, the Twitter, Twitter links I posted originally, and I'll post it again at the end. Um, one last thing I'll show you is this interact example. Um, so if you're familiar with things like uh, with, with Mathematica, um, I use Mathematica in my undergraduate work, uh, there's this really nice construct called manipulate in Mathematica where you can basically just sort of wrap your plotting function with this call to manipulate, and it'll give you some sliders and checkboxes that let you basically build custom little dashboards um, as you're doing plots. And I always wanted that. I always loved how smooth that was. And you can get pretty close to that workflow with, with IPy widgets. So here I'm going to create a, a, a figure widget and display it. This is now an, an empty figure widget. I've added an empty scatter trace to it so I can manipulate the scatter trace. And um, then I'm going to write this function called update. So what update's going to do is it's going to input a um, Basically, a phase and an amplitude um, for uh, a, sin a sinusoidal plot and also a color. So this one function takes in these phase amplitude, I'm sorry, the phase uh, frequency and, and color information, and then updates the x, y uh, values of the plot and, and the line color. This function gets wrapped in a decorator. This is this is provided by the IPO widgets library that lets you specify the range of values you want to sweep over. And when I run that. I automatically get this little dashboard of the um, 
two floating point values become sliders. The color values become a dropdown. And since I'm in JupyterLab, I can hide these cells. And now I have a dashboard where I can control this plot. Um, wasn't a lot of code to make. Uh, again, it's something that should be brief enough to fit into your analysis workflow once you, once you get the hang of it. Um, and also, I'm excited about how smooth this is. Um, this is a, uh, every time I'm incrementing the slider, uh, it is calling a Python function to update the, the view of the plot. Um, so the interactions here, even though you're using custom Python code, can be, still be very, very smooth. Um, I saw one question about how to update, how to, um, to pop out the output view again. Uh, so to get an output view, a secondary view of your plot in JupyterLab, you right click anywhere on the output cell. So it can be on the plot, it can be anywhere. Um, and in the context menu, there's an option, create new view for output. And you select that, it'll create you this extra, extra view. Um, that, I think, is all I'm going to show right now. I think I'm going to focus on a couple of questions now. Um, so one question that someone asked was, is it possible to do similar selections over multiple plots for 3D scatter plots? Um, I don't think there is a selection tool uh, right now for 3D scatter plots. It's possible I'm wrong about that, but I don't think there's a selection tool for 3D scatter plots themselves. Um, but what you can do is uh, sort of plot the pairs of the dimensions as 2D scatter plots. You can select them the 2D scatter plots, and you can update the 3D view with new colors. Um, so you could update the 3D plot in response to selections on other things, but I don't think there's currently a tool to do selection in 3D. That's kind of a kind of a hard problem. I'm not sure if we have any for that. All right. Uh, so those are the notebooks. Um, and one last one I won't run through this one is a uh, example of using data shader. So uh, if you've um, Seen, you may have come across data share before. It's a really interesting way to do visualizations for data sets that are much too large to send to the front end, to send to JavaScript. So if you're plotting in many millions of points or up to a billion points, um, you can use uh, data share to do some of the aggregation in the background and then just send the, the image of the plot to the front end. Um, data share is not integrated into Poly.py in any particular way right now. Um, but the new uh, property change, all the callbacks that are available make it possible to use data shader uh, to display information inside a Poly plot. And this notebook goes through some of the details of that. So just a quick uh, demo. If I zoom in on this uh, scatter plot, this is a million point uh, scatter plot. If I zoom in, you'll at first see all the, the image will expand. And then right after it expands, you'll see it kind of resamples and then becomes more precise again. So that resampling process is, uh, What's happening is that on, on that zoom, uh, Python function is getting run to recall data shader to build a new image to populate the, uh, populate the front end with that new scatter information. Um, so this is a fun example of, of using the different kinds of callbacks that are available now to do uh, some interesting things and to, to work in data shader here. All right, some other questions. Um, OK. Uh, any applications of this to create Gantt charts? So all of the, the past um, figure factories that are available in Poly.py to um, create complex figures like Gantt charts are still there. Uh, and you could wire up um, interactivity on top of them. Um, there's nothing, um, I would say, specific about, about Gantt charts. It would take a little bit of work to kind of dig into their properties to see how, how they're built. Um, but you could like do things like install callbacks to run on hover, uh, for instance, in, in a Gantt chart. Another question is, could I elaborate on the difference between this and dash? Sure. So um, I see what I see this is that the Jupyter notebook and doing interactivity in the notebook. This is a way for data scientists to uh, explore data for themselves and to share interactive reports with each other. So sort of data scientist to data scientist. Um, it's very lightweight. It's very easy to build these little dashboards and widgets and things. Um, but it's not very easy to make them look good. Um, you don't have a lot of options on the styling of stuff, and you're, you're very much locked into this notebook, notebook view. Um, Dash is very powerful for, I would say, I characterize it as a, as a data scientist building, uh, building something for a, a manager or, or a general audience to look at, a full application. 
when you're using Dash, you can build stuff that doesn't look like you made it in Python. It looks like a full web application with custom CSS. You can customize everything. You can embed it in other, other frameworks. Um, so you have so much more flexibility with Dash. And it's a little, I think it's a little bit more um, of an overhead to get to build that first sort of um, more design involved, whereas the notebook stuff is a little lighter weight. So notebooks for data scientists to data scientists, I see Dash as data scientists to uh, an external audience. All right. Create lots of selects and points and download only related data, for example, in a CSV file. So when you, um, the information you get when you lasso select points, um, you get uh, this points structure here, um, and that has the indices of the points that were selected. So whatever data you pass into a plot, like your x and y values, if you give x and y arrays, you'll get the indices into those arrays. So if those arrays came out of a big table, big data frame with other columns, you can use those indices to index into that data frame with pandas and then do whatever you want with them. So yeah, you could download them, you could write them out, you could print them, um, you could put them in another plot. Really anything you can do in Python, you could do with those, with those points. Next question, do I think the core plot maps will be updated in Plotly 3? Um, so the Plotly Python library is um, back to this distinction between the Python library and the JavaScript library. The Python library doesn't really have any um, any actual like uh, plotting code in it. All that is done in the, on the JavaScript side. So as new versions of the, Java, of the JavaScript traces come out, those will automatically get wrapped and provided in the Python library. So I don't have anything to say in particular about the, the core plot uh, stuff, but any updates that are made on the JavaScript side will come to, to the Python. Uh, next question, can we insert IPy widgets in Dash? That's an interesting question. I don't think so. Um, or at least I don't think I know how to do it. Um, it would definitely take some JavaScript work, but uh, those aren't, yeah, those aren't in the same ecosystem at this point. All right, well, we're past our 30 minutes, so we should uh, wrap this up. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming out. It was a lot of fun to show this stuff to you. Um, please explore the different resources and the uh, notebooks and things, and let me know what you think. All right, bye, everyone.